I'll give you a little bit of information. All right. So on a legislative front, we have a couple of things going on. Uh, one, not the least of which, of course, is a potential impending shutdown of the House and the government and all that. Yes, woe is me, apocalypse, blah, blah, blah. You're going to see more about that. Uh, the amount of the government that actually shuts down is actually kind of minuscule in one sense. I'm not trying to diminish it. But, folks, there's a lot of politic politicization going on. Um, it's very polarized right now. We're not seeing a lot get done. And, frankly, that's going to need to change. So don't let that sidetrack you. It will happen. There might be a continuing resolution kicking it to January. That's what's being pushed right now because, again, everybody who remembers, you know, I'm just a bill from Schoolhouse Rock, go back to it's got to pass in the House with the budget bills. They've got to pass in the Senate. And then they've got to meet together in the conference committee, work through all of that, and then vote in the House and the Senate again before it goes to the president. That's not likely to happen by, you know, Thursday, Friday. So, Continuing resolution will probably kick the car, kick the can down the road. And so we'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, one thing I want to mention to you is on the regulatory side, junk fees. Um, if you remember back to the White House blueprint for rental rights, one of the issues was junk fees. And what's going on is they're really looking at um, property owners and leases. And are you charging any kind of fees that are not listed in your lease? So please make sure your lease is clear. Make sure it is summing up each one of the fees or whatever, whatever cost there is. If you're not detailing that out, you are probably facing some sort of legal challenge at some point going forward here. Um, there are law firms that are looking for that. There's groups like Legal Aid that are actually funded by the government to come after you in this case. This is a simple way to protect yourself. Just make sure your lease is consistent. If you haven't talked with an attorney on this, especially a good real estate attorney that understands leases, it may be time to refresh that and get, get with them. Um, I want to mention to you foreclosures. There's a few articles out recently and people talking about on the foreclosure side, the residential rates of foreclosures are actually at some of the lowest rates we've seen. The commercial rates are climbing. Uh, BlackRock has turned in the keys to some different properties. There's more problems coming. Uh, there are a lot of smaller local and regional banks that are sitting on potentially a lot of bad paper. So just give you that as a, a notice. Make sure you're not over the thresholds of cash within a bank so that your FDIC insured still covers you. Um, and then the other side is be ready. When there's trouble like this, that may mean that somebody who has a couple of Larger office buildings typically may have a few smaller properties on the side that the big one goes on a fire sale and they have to liquidate and sell some of the other ones as well. So there may be some opportunities to pick up some deals coming forward that are attached to some of these large commercial investments. So just consider, consider that and just, as I say, words to the wise. Um, finally, I do want to mention, we talked about this last month, the Corporate Transparency Act and making sure that you are prepared. If you've got an LLC, if you're going to be doing business in the first part of the year, I encourage you to go ahead and get, you know, um, set up for that. Just maybe you need to put an LLC on the shelf right now and get, get it ready so that you're ready to go and do your business next year. Because as we go into the federal compliance starting in January for the Corporate Transparency Act, there's still a lot of people trying to figure out what this means. That means at the state level, there may be some stumbling, some bumps along the way. And therefore, you need to make sure that you are prepared and have you know, an LLC ready to go where they're trying to create one in January. And they tell you, well, we can't do it yet. We're not in compliance, so we can't do anything. Well, we don't want you to lose deals because you weren't prepared for it. So we want to make sure you've got a heads up on that. Um, additionally, there are some other regulatory issues going on. Part of that is um, regulations that are being theoretically or potentially changed. We are working on some of those and, and also partnering with some of the housing coalition members to send in letters on that. Most of these are not letters that we need from a vast group of people. Uh, we do on seller finance. I would encourage you to go to our action center with national RIA and you can send out uh, a letter it's real simple. It needs your physical address and then your email address. And it knows which congressman to send it to, and it will ask them to become a sponsor. So I encourage you to go do that. 
And then finally, we do have an event that we're working with with Seller Finance Coalition to actually coming up, I think it's December 14th. And that is going to be an all day event. And this is a, a fundraiser that the Seller Financing Coalition is doing. So encourage you to do that. We'll post up some information on that as well. And that's again, helping Seller Finance Coalition move forward with this bill that we're supporting that you can go to the Action Center and, and, and support as well. So with that, those are the main issues we've got going on right now, unless there's any questions. I will move us along here and we will focus on a couple of th things. I think Carl, I'm gonna pass it over to you to start off with. Hey, thanks a lot, Charles. That was some pretty interesting news. Um, I'm just gonna take a couple of uh, minutes for, uh, um, uh, you know, letting everybody know that Camel Plan is now the preferred uh, administrator for national RIA for IRAs, 401ks, and uh, QRPs. So the first thing that, as, as a result of that, the first thing we're going to do is November or through December 31st, everybody uh, that's a national RIA member and their families can open up an account uh, and fund it for $1. Okay, well, that, that'll be the opening account fee. Uh, the second thing I want to make sure everybody understands is we're not like equity trust. We don't have any annual fees until you do a deal. So if you're just sitting in cash, we're not going to take the $300 or $400 that equity trust does. Um, we want people to be ready to do deals. We don't want to see them losing their money if the timing isn't right or they don't have the right deal for them. We want them to have, spend their time doing the due diligence on the deals. Uh, and again, it's not like a 1031 uh, where you've got deadlines, et cetera. So there'll be no annual fees if you open up your account between now and uh, December uh, 31st. And next year, if you still haven't done a deal, you're not going to uh, pay any uh annual fees. Uh, and the next thing is, is that we'll prorate those annual fees. If you don't do your first deal until the second quarter, then three quarters of the year. Uh, we're also offering free consultation with a Cama plan founder, uh, of which I'm one of, and uh, Maggie Palisano is another uh, one year VIP customer service, meaning that your deals will go out within 48 hours of receiving them and one free expedited transaction. So if you need it to go out in 24 hours, uh, we'll give you one of those uh, for the year after you sign up. And also we'll give two complimentary outgoing wires uh, in, in your year after you sign up. So that's uh, primarily what you're what you're going to have. We also have a uh, a number, uh, a VIP customer service number, and I forget exactly what it is. I thought it was on this form, but we'll get that out to National Rea, who can send it to all of the uh, uh, individual Reas that are out there. Uh, and I apologize for not having that, but use the uh, number that's in the plan right now and just tell them you're a national RIA and you want to be connected to the VIP service and we'll handle that. Uh, and, and we're, uh, we've been with national RIA for almost 20 years and we're thrilled now that uh, we're finally their preferred uh, IRA 401k administrator provider. And if there's any questions out there, I'm able to take them now. If not, feel free to call me on my, uh, uh, the, the VIP service number is 386-7490. Uh, Someone just put it in the, uh, in the, in the thing. Thanks, Lori, I appreciate it. Um, so you have that number. Uh, and if you have any questions, put them on the chat and we'll answer them or, uh, um, you know, let us know afterwards, call the office, and we'll help uh, help you get, get every one of your questions answered. And I'm just proud and excited uh, 
uh, uh, to be a preferred vendor for National RIA. Well, Carl, it's been a long time coming. We appreciate your friendship over the years and look forward to this business partnership. Um, it, it's a real benefit for our members, and this is a great way to start building uh, building wealth through your IRA. And Carl has a great process for really starting to build that. Um, so thank you, Carl, for that. And then appreciate the information posted up there. Make sure you take a look at that. Reach out to him. Uh, and, and as you build that wealth, let me say this. One of the things you want to keep in mind is how do you become your own bank even? As you start with a small amount, we want to grow that. One of the ways we can do that is, you know, Jason, why don't you take it over and tell us how we can go to that next level with it as well. Hey, Charles. Good segue. I love it. Thank you. Um, yeah. So my name is Jason Powers. I'm with Unbridled Wealth. We have uh, partnered with National RIA uh, this year. You guys have probably seen it around um, effectively all things, I like to say all things life insurance and infinite banking. And so um, we're going to kind of, I'm not really going to touch on infinite banking today. We've done that in the past. We will do it more in the future. Uh, I'm going to give you a website here in a little bit. You can get more information about it. But the uh, the big reason we're here today is to talk about a new product we have available uh, for you guys called Instant Term Life Insurance. Okay, can you guys see the screen okay? Yep. Thumbs up. All right, all right. Instant Term Life Insurance, which we just rolled out. And uh, this would be a good product for a lot of you guys and, and your friends and family. Uh, there are so many instances where you need to get life insurance or sufficient life insurance in play. Okay, so this instant term works. It's, uh, you know, no lab work exams and, and this drawn out uh, underwriting process that one can usually go through if you qualify for this. You answer a few health questions and we'll determine el eligibility. We can get an offer literally within minutes. Okay, so um, be sure to uh, keep this link handy. We'll be sharing this uh, uh, throughout the year as well. So why why would you get instant term life insurance? Why would you need uh, term life insurance in general? Well, one of the big ones that's coming up more and more is securing loans. Sometimes um, uh, they we need collateral. Uh, so some investors may use life insurance, you know, for collateral for loans, which may be used obviously to invest further. Uh, that's that's been an up and coming one, especially with SBA. SBA loans even are starting to require uh, a lot more of that. Business partnerships. If you have partnerships in businesses, it's always good to have something in place to buy out the partner if, God forbid, something happens to them um, and just protect the investments. Often in partnerships, you don't if if your partner dies, you don't want to become partner with the spouse. And so we can help you work through those situations. But uh, if you need to get coverage in place quick, uh, this would be a great option for you, uh, as well as uh, situations like you hear about divorce decrees, you know, where you've got to get sufficient coverage um, for the children's sake and so forth, when you got to get it in place quick. Of course, other life changes, you know, I always say life changes and so does your coverage needs. You get married, you have another kid, you have new debts new responsibilities and so much more stuff. And you're like, oh, shoot, you know, met a guy, met a guy not too long ago. Uh, he's getting married and he promised the the father-in-law to be that he would have sufficient life insurance coverage. And he's had like a week before his marriage, his wedding. And he's like, oh, no, I didn't get it yet. And so he come out here and he's doing this instant term thing and going to pump it through, you know, so that's a good, that's a good, uh, you know, emergency backup plan, you know, have something in place. And uh, real estate transactions in general, you know, ensure your investment properties are protected. If you've got family, uh, don't leave them with these debts. If something happens to you, just have proper coverage. And that's something if you need help working through how much is appropriate for me, call me, email me. Let's figure it out. Let's see how much you need to get. That's just appropriate. General estate planning. I mean, it can provide funds to leave a legacy, settle debts, keep your real estate holdings intact for your heirs, of course. And then, of course, you know, the tax planning side of thing provide funds to pay real estate taxes. I mean, that's a huge one. I mean, when you are, you know, your, your estate taxes, I should say. And, and that's a huge one. We get a lot of people, high net worth people and, and they're like, well, my kids will be fine. We have, you know, multi millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of real estate. We're going to leave behind us, stuff like that, but they're not really factoring in the tax bill that is going to kick in. And so let's get a, a, let's get a life insurance plan in place to help curb that a little bit. And of course, you know, have it for peace of mind, for your family's peace of mind. You know, 
and and so give us a call. Um, go to 1024 well slash NREIA, and there'll be a link there at any time where you can go and get a um fill out the form, get an instant offer. We'll put this in the chat as well. And uh uh Track me down. I'm going to put my contact information in there in a minute too. Track me down. If you have general questions, you're like, I don't know what kind of coverage I need. If if you don't need term, you need permanent insurance, give me a call. Let's talk through it. Let's see what we can do for you. You know, we've, we've Charles alluded to earlier, this infinite banking model uh, utilizing properly structured whole life insurance. And, and that's, that's what we do. I mean, that's our forte. And that's that's something I would love to help you with and uh, get you guys going. So anyway, 1024wealth.com slash NREIA. And we'll look forward to hearing from you guys. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, you know, we, we, we want you to succeed. That's simple as it gets from building wealth over a long time. This is There's no get rich quick schemes. Those are just, uh, <laughs> that's a fast way to lose. So one of the things you want to do when you're considering this is you're building, you're building your IRA, you're building you got your insurance, you got your real estate, you're building these pieces in place. And at some point you kind of go, now what do I do? How do I handle this? How do I structure some of this? And start looking at multiple structures and questions along those lines. And we had a, a real blessing in, at our cruise in Alaska and Mary Hart joined us and spoke along the lines on these issues. So, with that, I'm going to invite Mary to come in, and we'll do a little bit of a, uh, some Q&A back and forth. But Mary, I want you to go ahead and kick off. Tell us a little bit about yourself to start. Sure, sure. So I um, have been a licensed attorney for, gosh, 30-some years now. What is this? 20, almost 33 years. I retired a few years ago as an attorney, but I still do consulting with the same information, just I don't call it legal advice anymore. So I don't have to carry my malpractice insurance. But anyway, so I'm I'm a retired attorney, but I'm also a, a real estate investor and have been so for about 20 plus years, a little over 20 years. I have vacation rentals, retail spaces. Um, I'm a private lender. Um, I've got some farmland, things like that. And now I spend most of my time, if I'm not managing my own investments, I spend most of my time teaching to others around the country. And I run a a membership based platform for real estate investors called uh, the aim higher Academy or alternative investing movement.com. So I do sort of all things, real estate and all things, estate planning and asset protection planning is where my focus is these days. That is awesome. That was, that was a lot to take in to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and there's probably more to it that I didn't even tell you about, but anyway, yeah. I was say, I, I didn't know you could pass the bar at 10 years of age. So congratulations yeah, we, on that. You're very That's, sweet. You're very sweet, but no, no. Been, so, been around this world for a little while. I understand. And, and, and you've actually been around quite a bit of the world. I understand traveling. You've been able to, you know, put, put the structures in place so that you can actually take advantage of the really enjoying the world and traveling. Uh, yes. Where are a few of the places you've traveled to real quick? Oh, my gosh. Well, I've been many places in Europe, of course, and also Croatia, a lot of places in the Caribbean. I'm heading to Australia and New Zealand in April. I'm going to the Grenadines in February. I'm going to uh, Vienna, and, and, well, Germany and Austria in December. So I've got a lot of travel coming up. I'm dragging my husband with me reluctantly. He's not a big traveler, but... He's looking forward to the Christmas trip because we're going to see all the Christmas markets on the Danube River. So he's very excited about that. But um, Croatia was one of our favorite places. That was a surprise for me. I didn't realize how wonderful it was. Um, and of course, I love everything Europe and everything Caribbean. So lots of different Absolutely. Places. Absolutely. So if I want to go down this road of protecting, transferring, building structure to take care of wealth, I, I want to, I'm going to ask you a couple different questions. One is kind of what should I do? And just in terms of like some basic steps to start moving forward. And we'll, we'll start there. Sure. And I, I'm assuming you're talking about sort of the estate planning aspect. You know, we, Correct. we as real estate investors work really hard to build our wealth, but I don't think we give much thought to how we pass on our wealth. That's... And, you know, we tend to think we're immortal. Um, and we, or we think, oh, that'll happen in the future when I die. And of course things happen unexpectedly. Uh, so I, I focus a lot on estate planning. In fact, I call it your ultimate love letter because I think it's the nicest gift you can give to your loved ones is to actually put something in place 
to make things easier when you either become disabled or you die. And these are topics nobody likes to talk about, but the bottom line is that it's important. We will all die one day, and many of us will become disabled where we are not able to make our own decisions. And I think the latest study says that 67% of Americans don't have any sort of estate plan in place at all. So where you start, I think, is that there, there are four to five critical documents that I think everyone 18 or older should have. One is, uh, there's some for when you're alive but can't make your own decisions. So one of them is your healthcare power of attorney, which is a document that allows you to appoint someone to make your healthcare decisions for you if you cannot make them yourself. Um, and if you don't have that document and something happens and you are unable to make your own healthcare decisions, someone has to rush to court to be appointed as your guardian. And that is expensive and time consuming and stressful. So a healthcare power of attorney is very, very important. You can name one person or multiple people. They have to act together or you can say each one can act separately. You can name contingent um, agents to act for you. The first one can't act, for instance. So healthcare power of attorney, um, a what we call a durable power of attorney, which is for everything but healthcare. So who makes your decisions um, about everything but your healthcare if you can't do it? Who sells that apartment building if you're disabled and you can't sign the closing papers? Who does your banking? Who signs up for you know pays your insurance premiums? Who I mean, think of all the decisions you make every day from the time you put your feet on the floor in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. And if you can't do it, who makes that decision for you? And if you don't have a power of attorney that appoints someone, we're back in the guardianship realm if you can't make your own decisions. So those two powers of attorney are very, very important. I think it's a, this is a personal decision, but if you would not want to be kept alive by artificial means like um, a ventilator or something else, then you need to have what we call a living will. That's a very crudely put uh, called the pull the plug document. If you're never going to recover um, and you could be kept alive for a long, long time just on life support, uh, but you would not want that, then you need to have a living will, which is the document that gives your health care agent the authority to ask the hospital to terminate life support. The so, so Mary, I'm going to interrupt you real quick on that. One. I'm going to encourage people as you're going into the holidays this, this, this season, and you're sitting down with family, if you're if you're putting one of those together, make sure they know. Because pulling that out at the last minute in a highly emotional state, people are, well, what, what do you mean they did this? They did, you have that conversation with not only whoever's gonna be the exit, the, I can't say the word, the executive of the, of the process. The executive, what you're talking about, yeah. Thank it's you. It's hard. But, but, but make sure that the rest of the family knows that's what your intention is, because that's something that you want to address that before the emotional strain and all the stress comes on. So I say that having done grief counseling before and working through those, you that's a fast time to make your family really go through a lot of stress that they don't need to. So sorry, Mary, I got to kick that back. No, that's a very, I think that's a very important point because I've seen a lot of families fall apart if something happened to mom or dad and nobody ever had the discussion about who was in charge, you know, cases where people have named the youngest child because that child was the most capable, but the older siblings did not understand that and never spoke to that child again. Um, all sorts of things. So I think that's a very, very good point. They are hard conversations to have, but I think they're necessary. And I think if you approach it like, hey, guys, you know, life is finite and we're not getting any younger every day. This side, the dirt's a great one, but and in yep. case there's one day where I'm not able to make my own decisions or I'm deceased, let's talk about it and start that conversation. And, you know, I find that a lot of people don't want to have that conversation or do their documents because they feel like that's sort of acknowledging their mortality and that they're going to die if, if they talk about it. And I used I to that. tell them, hey, Murphy's Law says that just means the more you prepare, the less likely anything is to happen to you. So, you know, <laughs> that's exactly it. Death or taxes. That's it. Right. We, we, that's right. They're both guaranteed. I mean, we're all going to die one day unless some new fangled thing comes out we're not we're not aware of. <laughs> but I think, you know, back to those documents, the, the fourth one that I think is very important is your will. You know, your or third one, I guess, your no fourth one, fourth one, your last will and testament. Everybody over 18, 18 or over, should have some form of a last will and testament. Because I don't care if you think you have nothing. You have something. It could be a car. It could be a $1 IRA. It could be, which is not, doesn't go through your will, but it could have something that somebody's got to manage. And if you don't have a will, then your state legislature has one for you. And it might not be what you like, 
The state will say who gets your stuff and how. Um, the state will have a priority of who gets to be appointed as the executor, or what we mostly call the personal representative now. And that personal representative will have to post a bond out of their own pocket every year that that estate is open to make sure that they don't abscond with the money. And in a will, you can waive that bond requirement. So your loved one that you've appointed doesn't have to come out of pocket for that bond. So a will can be very, very simple. It can be a couple of paragraphs. And in a lot of states, we're allowed to do a handwritten will uh, that is valid as long as everything is in your own handwriting, signed and dated. Uh, you don't need witnesses or a notary. That's not in every state. So you've got to check your own state's laws to make sure if you want to do your handwritten will. Um, but if you're waiting to get to the lawyer, you're saving up money to pay for a lawyer, if your state allows that, it's called a holographic will, H-O-L-O-G-R-A-P-H-I-C, a holographic will. You can Google it. Does your state allow a holographic will? Then while you're waiting to go to the lawyer, you can just, you know, write on a piece of paper, the last will and testament of Mary Hart, and just say, you know, I, Mary Hart, make this my last will and testament. Say what you want to happen to your stuff, name somebody as the executor, name somebody as the alternate, date and sign it and call it good. That's a quick and easy stopgap measure. Um, you know, the other document that I think is important is what we call a HIPAA waiver. You guys know HIPAA that is the privacy rights for your medical information. You sign all those notices at your doctor's office. I like to do a HIPAA waiver for the people I've named as a healthcare agent under my healthcare power of attorney to make sure they can get your healthcare information to make um, good decisions if they're your agent. So those are those are the main ones. And then you and might want to trust that that's a bigger conversation for your question. It, it, and that last one there is important. I was a, a Medicaid medical guardian for a senior lady at our church. She didn't have any other family and she had to have surgery. And I, you know, took her to all the doctor visits ahead of time. We went to the surgery and, you know, after the surgery, the doctor comes out and meets and he pulls me aside and he says, all right, young man, I appreciated that. He said, technically, I'm not actually supposed to talk to you because you don't have a HIPAA on file. Yep. Go get that paperwork done. Yes, sir. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of my wake up call to go, you know, I, I can't properly even help take care of her if I don't have that done. So those are forms that, you know, doctors get real, you know, the, the attorneys for the hospitals will crank down on them and then they can't tell you anything. So That's making right. sure you've got that in place is very important. And I think if you go to an estate planning attorney in your state and you just get a basic will and these powers of attorney and the, the living will and the HIPAA waiver, you know, you should be able to get it for $1,500 or so. You know, mm. It's not like it's tens of thousands or anything. And I think it's something worth saving for or paying for um, just to give you peace of mind. You can always go back and beef things up later, add a trust or, you know, make the will more complicated if you want to, but at least get something in place that will cover the basics if something happens to you. I mean, we learned in, in COVID that people could die very unexpectedly, right? Or, you know, my husband had cancer this past year. He's doing fine now, but for a while there, it was kind of touching up. So you just, you just don't know. You, know, you just don't know. And, and you don't want to be trying to doing that, do that in the middle of that emotional yeah. emergency. You want to be able to focus on the crisis at hand. So that's great advice. So let me let me flip that around on you, Mary, and just ask you kind of the other side. What are some of the myths that you see and hear? And if you want to just debunk a couple of those for us, just share those with us. Sure. Well, one myth that, that I see, and we brought this up on the cruise, you might remember I showed that little video. Um, you know, people think if they're married, they don't need an estate plan because everything will automatically go to their spouse and that their spouse can automatically make their medical decisions or make their financial decisions. And that is not true. That's a myth. The only way that things automatically go to your spouse is if you guys own things as joint tenants with the right of survivorship or as tenants by the entirety, or you've named the spouse as the beneficiary. But if you have an asset in your separate name and you die uh, without a will, it doesn't necessarily all go to your spouse. Like under state law, that state law will I told you about, sometimes the spouse has to share it with his or her stepchildren or his or her in-laws or something else. It really just depends. So that's a huge myth. Um, the other myth is that that everything passes through your will because that, that's probably the biggest mistake I see when I meet with people is they, they have a will and they assume it will cover everything. But a will only governs those things that you own in your separate name. 
Uh, no other joint owner with a right of survivorship, no designated beneficiary. It's not in a trust, but just your name. So if my name is on the deed as Mary Hart, that house will go through my will. If it says Mary Hart and uh, Carl Fisher as joint tenants of the right of survivorship, and I leave in my will, Charles, that you get my half of the house, it's not going to go to you. It's going to go to, to uh, Carl because he's a joint owner with a right of survivorship. So people write a will and they don't understand that it doesn't govern everything. Mm -hmm. So we the, the biggest thing people need to understand is how an item passes at death, which all depends on how it's titled and whether it has a beneficiary and co-owners and all that kind of thing. The way it's titled during your lifetime and it's set up the ownership will dictate how it passes at death. That's a huge myth that has really messed up a lot of people's intentions. We know it when someone dies, we know what their intentions are and it didn't work that way. So say that st statement again. Which you, one? <laughs> you, you just said that last piece about how it passes at death. Oh, yeah. Depends so, on how. Mm -hmm. How an item is owned during your lifetime will dictate how it passes at death. For instance, if something is just in my separate name, just my name alone, it will pass through my will if I have one or through that legislative will if I don't have one, i.e. through the law that the state legislature has created. Um, if you own something as a joint tenant with a right of survivorship, it will pass to the survivor not through your will, because by operation of law, it's got that right of survivorship that goes to the joint owner. If I own something as a tenant in common, that is treated as if, let's say, Charles, you and I own a piece of property as tenants in common, 50-50. My 50% is treated as my separate property. It would go through my will. Your 50% is treated as your separate property to go through your will. But if that deed, instead of reading tenants in common, said tenants, uh, joint tenants with the right of survivorship, that changes the whole ball game. Now it passes automatically to you if I die. Doesn't go through my will. So does the deed read, you know, Mary Hart and Charles Tassel as tenants in common or Mary Hart and Charles Tassel as joint tenants of the right of survivorship? You see the difference? Mm -hmm. if something yeah. might be in my individual name, but it has a designated beneficiary like my IRA. That's not going to go through my will. It's going to pass to my beneficiary by that contract. It's a beneficiary designation. If it's owned by a trust, it's not going to pass through my will. It's going to pass through the to the beneficiaries named in the trust document, right? So what I tell people is create a spreadsheet, list every single asset you have an ownership interest in, whether it's 1% or 100%. Look at the titling document, whether that's a deed or the signature card at the bank or your stock account or whatever it is, and write down exactly how it is owned. Is it Mary Hart individually? Mary Hart and somebody else is joint tenants with the right of survivorship. Mary Hart and somebody else is tenants in common. Does it have a beneficiary designation? Is it in a trust? You know, figure out how it's titled. That dictates how it passes at death. Because if you just assume everything goes through your will, your intentions are not going to be effectuated necessarily. You see what I mean? Did that make sense? It does. That That is... Well worth noting. That's why I wanted to make sure you expanded on that piece of it. I appreciate that because. Yeah, and I've seen so many cases where we know what somebody intended because their will said it. Like, I think one I mentioned on the cruise was a, a retirement plan in the state of Alaska where the, the woman had set up her retirement benefits when she joined the state that's uh, of Alaska as a worker that said, you know, X percentage to my partner and X percentage to my sons. And then in her will, years later, she changed it. So we all knew what she wanted, a larger percentage to her partner. It was 25%, and then she gave her partner 50%. But that's not what happened because she never changed her beneficiary designation on her retirement plan. So that retirement plan was not governed by her will. It was governed by the beneficiary designation, which never got changed. Does that make sense? Yeah. That does. Yeah. So that's somebody just had a question along that line about titling property for a revocable trust to avoid probate. So remember I said the only things that go through your will, that's what goes through probate, what goes through your will. And the only things that go through your will and through probate are assets that you own at the time of death in your separate name. So again, if I own my house and my deed says Mary Hart and my name alone, it's going to go through my will and go through probate. If, however, I redeed that house from me to me as the trustee of my revocable living trust, 
Now it's not in my individual name. It's in my revocable trust. So when I die, that house will now pass through by, according to the terms of the trust and will avoid probate because it it's not in my separate name any longer. So I, if I want to set up a revocable living trust to avoid probate, which I think is a great idea, I have one. I've set one up for all my kids, all my adult children. Um, then you want to make sure that your assets are titled in the name of your trust or the trustee of your trust, because you've got you have this beautiful 40 page trust. But unless you do something to title the assets in the name of the trust, those assets don't go through the trust. They either go through probate if they're in your separate name or go to a joint owner or whatever. But I think that's a very good question. We need to get it in the trust. And people get confused about their LLCs. Well, I don't understand how to get my LLC into my revocable living trust, right? Well, it's just that your trust or you as the trustee of your trust becomes the member of your LLC. So, and I've done this many times. I've started an LLC, say, before I had my revocable trust, and I, Mary Hart, was the member. When I set up my revocable living trust, I assigned my LLC membership interest for Mary Hart individually to Mary Hart as trustee of the Mary Hart Trust or whatever I called it. That took it from the box, my probate box, into my living trust box, and now it will avoid probate when I die. So all my LLCs own my houses. None of them will go through probate because the LLCs are in my revocable living trust, so the entire LLC will pass to my beneficiaries without going through probate, and the houses will follow along. So my stock accounts are in the name of my living trust, my bank accounts with the exception of one small one. My car is in the name of my trust. So all those titling documents, the owner is now Mary Hart as trustee of the Mary Hart Trust, not Mary Hart individually. That was a long explanation, but hopefully that made that sense. Was a, that was a very good explanation. Thank you. Sure, sure. Let's see. I don't know if there's any other questions coming in here. Um, I, I do want to add a sixth document along for you. Okay. I thought the first five are fantastic and no correction on that. But this is something that's coming out of a recent incident where a friend of mine, his wife owned the business, she ran the business, she managed the business, and she had a stroke. Yep. And the next day, he was going nuts trying to find the passwords, oh, trying yeah. to find the accounts, didn't know who's supposed to pay what, didn't have that information. And um, he came around and he's like, I'm telling each one of you, please make sure you put together a little spreadsheet, put it in the safe, update it when you change your passwords. But, you know, as you come in, there's often times in December, I'll write, okay, this week between Christmas and New Year, you've got some downtime, take this time to, you know, back up your computer, make sure your passwords and all those accounts are correct. Yep. That's, that's the kind of document, Mary, I'm sure you've seen that as well. Somebody going, how do I get into it? Yeah. Well, in fact, I'll, I'll take it a step further than just passwords. I'm actually in the process of creating a workbook for myself that I, I want to make available to other people down the line. But and I call it your ultimate love letter workbook because it's not just passwords. Yes. It's who pays the bills? What's on auto pay? What account does it come out of? How do the property taxes get paid? When are they due? Here's a copy of my social security card. Here's a copy of my passport. Here's a copy of my global entry card. Here's my military benefits, whatever it is. You need a comprehensive document uh, that somebody can just look at and take over everything. Because in my life, my husband doesn't do any of this stuff. I do it all. Everything's in my head. Um, and so he's petrified. If something happens to me, he doesn't even know where, what checking accounts we have. You know, he has one that he uses and the rest of them for all the different properties and everything else. He just trusts me to get all the bills paid and the property taxes done and all that. So, you know, I don't, he doesn't know my social security number. He, he doesn't know any of that. So it's, it's driven by my desire to make sure I don't leave him high and dry, but every yep. single person, that's the second piece of the estate plan. The first piece is getting all the documents in place, really. And the second piece is titling everything correctly. Third piece is having that notebook where every piece of information you think somebody might need down to who's the HVAC vendors. You know, what 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 HVAC systems are on automatic inspections? You know, which ones aren't? Who's your Orkin person? Whatever, all that. I guess say even the backflow preventer, who's the plumber that does that? Trust me. Absolutely. I, yeah. Going through and, and and you said something right, that's very important. It's all in my head. Yeah, it's all in my head. And, and you know, when we make ourselves indispensable like that, and sometimes we don't take the time, 
all we've done is put somebody else in a world of hurt. Right. And there's a lot of pressure on us. I mean, I, it makes me very stressed out. In fact, it's on my goal to finish by the end of uh, 2023 is to get my workbook done, get all my estate planning documents in a, in a good place. And they're mostly there. I just got to tweak a few things. But that workbook is not done. You know, it started on a, on a spreadsheet on my computer, but nobody would know how to find it. So that's my goal. And Jane Garvey has a, a absolutely good recommendation, uh, property at a glance worksheet for every property. That's one of the things I'm doing. So my cover sheet will list every single asset. And for each, say each LLC or each property, it'll say like C schedule A or whatever. And then there'll be, you go look there and it has every detail. Yeah, when you purchased it, what you purchased it for. Here's a copy of the HUD you know, all that stuff. What's every monthly recurring bill? What are the property taxes? Who are the vendors? All of that stuff needs to go for every single property, especially if you're an investor like I am, where you've got multiple LLCs and layers of LLCs. Um, you know, gosh, my husband would roll over. He would have no idea what to do. So I feel a uh, lot of pressure right now to get it done. <laughs> I'm healthy. That's a, I'm 60, that's, so you never know, right? That, never that's know. a good thing because yeah, because you never know. Um, but you mentioned your husband had the cancer this year. Yep. My wife had it three years ago, been fine since. Thank you yep. for everybody's prayers on that. But it's one of those things that you just don't know. And when that happens, you know, it's everything else stops. And, you know, thinking clearly, um, sometimes we talk about terms of, you know, when you're fearful, it's amazing what happens to your brain, how parts of it shut down. Yep. When you're going through that emotional stress, your, your life partner, that's a situation where you want, you, you're not going to be thinking straight and you want to have as much of that on, you know, prepped, ready, easy street so that you can just move forward and take care of the people you love. Absolutely. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's critical and people don't know how many times people came into my office as a lawyer after their partner had died or their parent had died and they were, they couldn't grieve properly because they were in so much stress and turmoil because they had no idea how to take care of anything. Either there was no estate plan or there were documents, but no idea what the person owned or how to find out anything. It was very stressful. Yeah. So good point. Absolutely. So I don't see any other new questions in there. Hopefully we bummed everybody out, getting ready for Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> so but there are a few more coming in there, but while, while we're looking at those, I do want to mention this is a good thing for Thanksgiving because folks, we are thinking about how to take care of our families, which we have. So we want to be thankful for them, make sure we're taking time for that. And, and at that same time, there's responsibility with that. So with that, uh, we got a couple of last questions here. Let me grab those. Mary, do you got touch on that? Uh, let's see. Is there a list of recommended estate attorneys? You know, it really depends on, on where you're living um, I might know some, but mostly you should look uh, probably at like lawyers.com, I think is put out by a group called Martindale Hubble. Uh, they think they have some ranking of lawyers, but I usually say pick two or three, look at their websites, get a sense for who they are, what type of representative client they have, and then call a few of them and see if you get a good sense from even how the phone is answered, you know, how professional are they? Um, for real estate investors, you want to make sure that that estate planning attorney understands real estate, LLCs, S-Corps, you know, and a good estate planning attorney will understand all that. Uh, self-directed IRAs, many attorneys don't have a clue what that is. The good news is, is they're not, the self-directed IRA is not part of your estate plan uh, in terms of the documents because it passes outside of your estate planning documents uh, according to your beneficiary designation. But I don't have any specific names to give you, but that gives you some idea of what to do. Somebody says, can we use you? Um, I, I'm not practicing law in terms of I'm not drafting documents anymore. Where people tend to hire me is if they, they want to get um, a good idea of what their estate plan should look like before they go to their attorney. So we can spend more time than you usually can with the attorney. And we literally go through everything, your entities, your trusts, um, you know, if you have land trusts or personal property trusts, whatever it is, and come up with a game plan that then, you know, you can take that memo to your attorney and everything is, is already been talked through quite a bit with someone who is a real estate investor and an attorney and a 1031 qualified intermediary and a realtor and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's usually how I work on that. I just serve as a consultant but then another attorney will do your documents. I'm awesome. only licensed in North Carolina, so I can only draft them in North Carolina anyway. There you go. So mm -hmm. I also noticed that Michael put on here about Dashlane. There are different password, you know, holders, groups of them out there, different kinds of companies that will do that. Um, again, no matter what, 
make sure it's written down somewhere that just yeah. it just encourage it whether it's a single one or a group of them but getting that that spreadsheet as mary mentioned is absolutely critical so well um, and let me just say one thing yeah. about the passwords i like what michael said and i've done this too is you have a master password on one of those password apps you don't have to update your documents every time you change your password. You just make sure that in your estate planning documents, someone knows how to get into your password app. The other thing that's important is that in your estate planning documents, we need to make sure we're authorizing your personal representative or trustee, executor, whatever it is, to um, deal with your digital assets. So we need to authorize them, whether that's shutting down your Facebook account you know, getting to your passwords, whatever it is, um, make sure they have the authority to deal with digital assets. It's only been recently that states have been making that a default. So a lot of states don't have that as an automatic power. So we want to make sure it's in your documents. Excellent. Um, and, and actually, I'm going to open this one up too, because Julie just mentioned, and I've seen this over and over again, where kids, especially, and maybe even down to grandkids go, you, you deal with the tenants, you deal with the toilet, you deal with this property. I don't want to do this. This isn't me. Sometimes it's just a rebellious process. They're going through like, ah, you did that. I don't want to do it. But what do we do in those situations? How do we look at prepping that asset to transition and not leave them kind of, even as Jason mentioned, and so, you know, with, with a huge tax bill, uh, you know, sure. well, they're, the tax bill is one thing. The, the practicality of getting it sold is a different thing. Let me talk about the practicality of getting it sold. So that's really going to come down to your personal situation as to whether or not your kids don't want to have anything to do with it and you don't trust them to even wrap it up and sell it at anything other than fire, fire sale prices, right? If you don't trust your kids to do that or your spouse, then you want to authorize someone in your will whether you name a different executor, personal representative, or in your trust, you need to name someone and give them the authority, not even just the authority, you might even give them the direction to sell those assets uh, at a time that makes the most sense. Give them a period of time in which to do that, you know, a year, two years, whatever you think, so that someone doesn't race off and sell them quickly. Because if someone doesn't care enough about them to be um, to think about the timing of the sale, you're not going to, your state's not going to get the right amount of money. If someone's just in a hurry and wants the cash, you're not going to get the right amount of money for the, for the uh, property. Um, the other time we see fire sale prices uh, ties into the estate taxes. Estate taxes are due nine months after the date of death. We can extend the return for fifth until 15 months, but the money, the estimated amount still has to be paid at nine months. So what happens if all your estate is illiquid, like in real estate, and we've got to come up with cash to pay estate taxes within nine months of your death, that's when we see a lot of properties being liquidated for less than fair market value because people are desperate to sell. And the buyers know that. So they'll wait till the last minute and then offer fire sale type prices. So you want to make sure that you know whether or not you're going to have a taxable estate or are likely to have one. And if so, have something in place to get those taxes paid, whether it's life insurance or some asset that's liquid, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I think that's that's very, very important. I don't know if I, 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 I like I like the comment that Carol made earlier where she said at this point, they should be carrying out the decision, not making a decision. Right. And, and, you, and you put that together by putting the plan together. Yeah. Um, and Michael, I'm going to say this. I appreciate the question. I want to be careful that we're not. Let's look at a principle of when should you split up assets in, in LLCs or separate LLCs? Is there a principle involved behind that that you would suggest, Mary? Well, here's what I tell clients. because This is a, a very uh, common question that I've gotten over the years. And, and it's everybody's personality is going to be a little bit different. I see asset protection like a continuum. It's a, it's a line. And at the, the one end of the spectrum are people who don't want to spend any money, don't want to have any tediousness with entities, and don't care about asset protection. And on the other end are people who want the most complicated structure, don't mind paying the most fees and the most tediousness to have the most creditor protection. And where somebody falls on that continuum is a very personal decision. One of the things that I've talked to people about, and I've had some clients say to me is, uh, you don't necessarily want every egg in one basket. You know, if you had 100 properties and they're all in one LLC, somebody slips and falls in one, you've just opened up all 100 to a potential, you know, right. 
So a lot of times what my clients did and, and uh, is have only so many in an LLC that equate to the amount of equity they're willing to risk on any one LLC. Is that 50,000, 500,000? I don't know. That's a personal decision. Uh, for me, um, I think with the exception of two properties, all my properties are in different LLCs. Now, I'm mine are bigger properties. I don't have uh, single family homes. So mine are more commercial properties, farmland, um, higher end vacation rentals. I put each one in an LLC uh, because I want to make sure I get the creditor protection from an LLC and all of mine are paid off and have high equity. So if, if I had small equity, I might lump them all together, but I don't want to have somebody slip and fall in property one and risk all the equity on all the properties. So all mine are separated except for two. <clears throat> Other people I know have said, well, I'm, I'm only putting 20% down on each single family home and I'm going to put them all in one LLC till I've got $250,000 of equity at risk. Then I'll set up a second LLC, that sort of thing. So it's such a personal decision, Michael, um, whether or not you set up separate LLCs, because of course they require annual filings with the state. They're a little bit of pain in the rear end. Um, so it's, it's just a very personal decision. But I would suggest you talk to an estate planning attorney um, about your particular situation and get some advice um, that's specific to you. So Mary, along those lines, I was always told by of our attorneys that, you know, the, the base level, once you have, you need to have at least about $1,500 worth of value, even to set up a, a legitimate LLC to kind of go from there. And then uh, the banking side was always one of those. Uh, I want a single entity LLC that we're going to put a mortgage on. So as you're going through that process, a couple of those principles that come into play. Yeah. But, so we're talking about the LLC on one side. At what point do you say you think putting the trust in place? What, at what point do you start to do that? So a revocable living trust or like yes. about land trust? Let, let's, let's just start with the revocable living yeah. trust. So, uh, you know, every state can be a little bit different, even down to the county, as to how onerous the probate process is. When I practiced law in Alaska, it was super easy. In North Carolina, it's super difficult and it's expensive. And, you, you know, every clerk will tell you something different. It's a horrible process. So for me, I just want to avoid probate, period, because I don't want my kids to have to go through that. So I, I wanted a living trust from the get go. You know, as soon as I started getting any assets, I wanted to put it in the living trust. Now, it took me a few years to get around to doing that. Um, but again, it's another personal decision about, well, how are the assets titled? Let's say everything is titled jointly with your spouse. That's great. You're going to avoid probate on the first death if everything passes to your spouse. But now you've left your spouse with all the assets in his or her name. Now you're going to go through probate on that death or leave that spouse to set up a trust and deal with all the tediousness after you die. Mm -hmm. So I, my point is, unless you know for sure that the county you're going to die in is simple, simple probate process, I would set up a living trust as soon as you can afford it. All right. It's, it's just, it makes it so much easier. I'll, I'll give you an example. Two couples uh, had come to me for planning fairly close in time to each other. One of them did their living trust and got all of their assets in it. The other couple talked about it, said they wanted to do it, but never got anything signed. They just kept postponing and postponing. Each of those couples was really odd because they came to be pretty close in time and each of them lost a spouse unexpectedly fairly close in time to each other. And these two couples came in to meet with me, the survivors of those two couples, like the same week after their partner had died, their spouse had died. The couple that had the living trust done showed up with their financial planner and everything was transferred basically within an hour. It was all done. And that spouse got on his motorcycle and rode out to California to hang out with the kids and everything was done. The other couple where nothing had ever been put in place, we went through years of a horrible probate process. Um, it was just, it was a nightmare. And only because they just never put that trust in place. They had the draft for me. They just never got around to signing it. I kept asking them to sign it and they just never did. So two very different situations, one with a trust, one without. And my mom, she died with a large trust. Everything was in it except one car that we couldn't find the title for and she wouldn't let me uh, apply for a duplicate. The large trust that had like four sub trust was done and settled pretty quickly. It took me two years to get the car probated. It was ridiculous. <laughs> for one, just so we could give it away to her neighbor. It was ridiculous. So anyway, I'm a big believer in avoiding probate if you can. 
and, and setting up those living trusts is is a little bit of paperwork, a little time consuming in the sense of putting your assets together. But we're really talking about a few thousand dollars typically. Yeah, I, I'd Several say forty five hundred is an average price, but you know, it depends on how complex you want to get. I mean, I've done them as as complicated as ten thousand, right? Just depends on what your situation is. But you know, if you can if you can save up five thousand, you're probably likely to get a pretty good estate plan out of that with the revocable living trust, the will, all those uh, advanced directives, the powers of attorney, and all that. Awesome. Well, we are pushing four o'clock here, so I do want to say thank you, Mary. Do, do you have any final comments you want to make? No, I think just you guys get it, get your estate plan in place. And I just, I preach it all over the country because I've seen too many war stories. So you've heard some of them here today. Um, you know, if you do need to reach me, you can find me at uh, Mary Hart at maryhart.net is the easiest way to find me. If you have a quick follow-up question, um, I'm not providing legal advice, but I'm happy to just answer something you didn't understand that we talked today. Well, okay. this, is, this is one of the most critical and important pieces, whether we're starting off with with a camp plan and growing, building up from there and getting the insurance and things in place to how we actually handle the structure. Let's face it. If you're living, you need to prepare for the backside. It's yeah. going to occur at some point. So going Mary, thank you again. And oh, thank you. For having me. Thanks Absolutely. for having me. Bye, everybody. Right. Have a good day. Take care. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. Bye bye.